Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, hi. You could hear me. Thank you. Uh, welcome to UCSD. Welcome to tonight's event. My name is Bob Akrahimi. I'm the director for the study of religion at UCSD. Uh, this event is sponsored by the religion program, by the, 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 the program for the study of religion at UCSD. And it's also co-sponsored by the Department of Literature and also Thermal Studies. Now, for the undergraduate students here, uh, I welcome you to look into the Department of Literature, re Study of Religion, also Thermal Studies, and uh, consider it as possible minors and majors. And obviously, I would encourage you to uh, enroll in our classes because we offer fantastic classes. Um, as for tonight's event, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Professor Karma Lecture Somo, a specialist in Buddhist studies. Uh, she has taught at the University of uh, San Diego, which is not far from here, since 2000. She offers classes in Buddhist uh, thought and culture, world religions, comparative religious ethics, religious and political identities in the global community, and negotiating religious diversity in India. Her research interests include women in Buddhism, death and dying, Buddhist feminist ethics, Buddhism and bioethics, religion and politics, Buddhist social ethics, and Buddhist transnationalism. She integrates scholarship and social activism through the Sakyadita International Association of Buddhist Women and Jamayang Foundation, an innovative educational education project for women in developing countries with 15 schools in the Indian, Himalayas, Bangladesh, and Laos. So I would like to us first to welcome Professor to begin the talk. Thank you. Good evening. Aloha and Tashi Dele. Can you hear me? Okay. Tashi Dele is Tibetan for congratulations. You are alive. Yeah, it's the standard greeting in Tibetan. So I'm very pleased and honored to be um, invited this evening to speak on the life and legacy of the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. So uh, I understand that you're going to have a um, commencement speaker this year, and that's really wonderful. You, we've been trying from USD for many years, but you did it. <laughs> so very good, very good. Um, I've been very fortunate to have met His Holiness the Dalai Lama a number of times. Um, in fact, I studied in the same village where he lives for 15 years. So, sort of like neighbors, you know, I mean, <laughs> but <laughs> um, we were very um, privileged to meet him often. And um, I've had an opportunity to sort of observe his life and his uh, way of being in the world since 1972. So I started studying in India. I dropped out of some of America's finest schools and um, <laughs> traipsed off to India. So uh, don't do as I did. Um, but um, I, that was just, um, at the time, that was the right thing to do. And wound up in India in the Himalayas and uh, a little village called Dharamsala. So Dharamsala is in Himachal Pradesh. And it's literally a village. So I was not sure exactly what to include in the presentation this evening. I, I had a whole bunch of slides about Tibetans in Tibet, Tibetans in the border regions, and Tibetans in India. But then I thought, well, let's focus on the life and legacy of the Dalai Lama. So too much. It, it was a bit too much. I think I had about 150 slides. So now we've pared it down to about 100. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to sort of do um, a photo journal, you could say, maybe, of his life and his work and his teachings. Um, he's a very famous person in the world, but there's so many facets to his life and to his philosophy um, that I thought it'd be interesting to look at it through photos. So my PowerPoint doesn't have any words. Hope you don't mind <laughs> it. Um, we start out by looking at the geography of Tibet, which 
as you all know, today has been absorbed into the People's Republic of China since 1959. Um, between 1950 and 1959, His Holiness tried to broker an agreement um, to allow Tibet to maintain its culture and religion uh, and let the PRC take care of the uh, foreign diplomacy and the currency and um, defense and all of that. But unfortunately, it didn't work out. And I'll, I'll illustrate you know, his eventual um, escape to India. But you can see here on the map today, this all looks like, can you see the slides? Is there any way to turn this down a bit? Or dim the lights? Dim the lights? You can see OK. OK, then. Um, you'll see that in this map, um, China is enormous. Um, when we look at the Tibetan cultural region, however, we'll find that about half of China's landmass today was historically, traditionally, according to the Tibetans, part of Tibet. So we have two different, every story has two sides, right? <laughs> and so we find that uh, this story also has two sides, the Tibetan perspective and the Chinese perspective. And there's some really good resources on this topic for those of you who are doing the more political side of things. Now you'll see back to this geogra geographical map that the population density of most of Tibet is, you know, sometimes you can go for hundreds of miles and not see a human being. You can see plenty of yaks and you know goats and all kinds of livestock but very few humans so um so here were the three regions of tibet traditionally you had in the central what they're calling tibet autonomous region um, was called utsang or central tibet the part the territory to the right to the east is called kam and now that has been absorbed into several different Chinese provinces, uh, particularly Yunnan and Sichuan. And then to the north, it was uh, at that time called Amdo. The Tibetans call it Amdo. And today, the Chinese call it Qinghai and um, Xinjiang, right? So here on this map, it says Qinghai Gansu. Um, but traditionally, they called it Amdo. Now, Tibet is very remote, and so many valleys have their own dialect. Some of the, we could even say different languages, because many of them are mutually incomprehensible. So um, today, the language has been standardized a great deal through the media. But more than Tibetan now, these days, Chinese language is being promoted. Uh, in the school, so you've probably been following the news with the language riots and the grade school children um, marching for the right to study Tibetan. Anyway, um, Tibet has been in the news a lot over the years. The most recent protests were in 2008. And you can see from the red dots on this map that there were, it was quite extensive. It was not simply in central Tibet. It was all over the map, literally. I've been to Tibet three times, and always wearing Chinese or Vietnamese robes. <laughs> um, and this was the first trip in 1982. In 1982, there were only 26 open cities in China. The first foreigners who traveled to China must have complained a great deal because they just closed it down. And there were only certain hotels in certain cities that we were allowed to stay in. And I finally got permission to go into this area of Tibet, what, what is traditionally considered Tibet in Amdo. Um, somehow the Chinese thought I might have a Chinese grandfather. <laughs> Maybe they were just being kind, but somehow they gave me a permit to tra travel into this area, but I wasn't able to travel to Lhasa. Uh, this particular monastery is called Labalangsi in, in Chinese uh, and Kumbum, J Kumbum in Tibetan. Um, it's, it was huge, a learning center until, 19, until the 1950s. And they had, um, in fact, the abbot was one of the brothers of His Holiness. And this is in the area where the Dalai Lama was born. 
So now it's a, I, I will say use the term His Holiness because in Tibetan language it's considered very rude to talk to uh, to speak about someone without using an honorific. In our language, I mean, we address people by their first names often, which is has changed. When I was a kid, you weren't allowed to address an adult by their first name, right? But today, it's quite common. So in Asian societies, normally, one does not speak the name of the person, but uses some kind of um, workaround. So in the case of an elevated person um, in the religious sphere in Tibetan, they would usually say His Holiness. In Tibetan, they call him the presence, uh, Kundun. And there's a film by that name, which I highly recommend. There if you're interested in learning more about his life and legacy, there are two films that I highly recommend. The first one is called Cry of the Snow Lion. Mm -hmm. It's a documentary, a really good one, with music by Philip Glass. And then another one is Kundun, Martin Scorsese. It's um, a feature film, but based on historical research. In fact, um, his Holiness' sister-in-law was the research director on the film, so it's quite accurate um, from the Tibetan perspective. And so, but it didn't stay in the theaters for very long due to um, s pressure from, yeah, the PRC. In any case, um, Tibet has a varied topography and climate. It's not all snow, although the Tibetan word for Tibet is, well, pe, but they usually call it uh, Gangchen, it, the land of snows. The land of snows, because they have beautiful snow mountains and beautiful lakes as well. In the southeast of the country, though, it gets quite tropical, which is probably what gave rise to the Shangri-La legend, right? There's some valleys of southwest Tibet that really are amazingly beautiful. And so we've, we get films like Lost Horizon and so forth that are based on this legend. Um, and this is uh, the Lake Kokonor up in northeast in the Amdo region. Um, and of course, there is a lot of snow in the winter, especially in the highlands. Um, the most famous feature probably of Tibet is the Potala Palace. Potala Palace had 1,000 rooms in it. Uh, built of stone and mud, so nothing luxurious, really. But it was big, and it had many shrines, hundreds of shrines. So this is where the Dalai Lama lived in the winter. And in the summer, he moved down to the so-called summer palace, which is just um, sort of like a guest house, again, made of m mud and stone, but lots of animals there. The Dalai Lamas always like to keep, you know, animals that they c that came from different parts of Tibet or different parts of India, like deer and things like that. So now here you see the snow lion, and the snow lion, of course, lives in the land of snows, and it's probably a mythological animal. But the Tibetans really think it's that they were around at least at some time. Um, maybe in hiding from humans who, but um, that's their legendary sort of mascot, the snow lion. And one of um, the largest Buddhist publishers in the United States is called Snow Lion Publications. <laughs> so you can see the architecture of Tibet is very simple. Um, in fact, you can collect the materials locally. You can just gather up the bricks, uh, the mud, and the uh, stone and just smush it together. They also had a kind of round earth construction uh, of the buildings. And then all you really needed to buy was the wood and the glass. But of course, wood and glass were very precious materials. So they had to be brought from far away. Uh, glass usually had to come over land by uh, donkey train from India. And so it had to be packed in big boxes with straw between them. I've seen it, it's quite amazing. Certain areas of Tibet did have trees at one time. Today, unfortunately, most of the forests have been uh, decimated. Now, 
religion was the central concern for the Tibetans. Before Buddhism was brought to Tibet in the 8th, 9th century, it's maybe 7th, but really got going in the 8th century, they had their own indigenous religion called Bun. Uh, Bun is still alive today. In fact, His Holiness considers it one of the five branches of religion in the Tibetan government. They have equal representation, even though there are only a few thousand Bumpos today. And they, uh, some of the other uh, schools of Buddhism have you know, thousands, tens of thousands. He gives the Bun equal representation because it is some bona fide part of Tibetan culture. It's also a very interesting tradition. Uh, to what extent Bun influenced Buddhism in Tibet is a matter of dispute. Some people think because Tibetan Buddhism looks quite unique, they, they write and they say that uh, Tibetan Buddhism is an amalgamation of Bun and Buddhism. The Tibetans hotly dispute this, <laughs> and they, they consider these two very different traditions. I think that there might be some influences, for example, in the way they um, construct their offerings on the altar, uh, perhaps their uh, intense concern with the question of death and dying. In these ways, maybe, maybe some of the prayer flags that you may have seen, the, the flags that fly with prayers that reach throughout the land, these might have had some indigenous roots but it's, not, um, it's very hard to verify this. Um, now they're searching through the Bun text, thanks to a Ford Foundation grant, actually, and finding what is unique about Bun, because today Bun looks very much like Buddhism. It's been very much influenced by Buddhism. So in the summertime, the monks would debate philosophy, and this was a tradition from India from between the 8th and 10th centuries. And Tibet is the only place where the tradition survived. In India itself, uh, Hinduism reasserted itself. They absorbed most of Buddhist thought and, and culture, uh, but they didn't want to give up their caste identity. So Buddhism gradually died out in most parts of India um, in, as an independent or a separate religious tradition. It became sort of part of Hinduism um, the, in large measure. So, um, but this dialectical mm, method of debating philosophy was preserved very well in Tibet. And it's quite amazing, all those of you who are interested in philosophy, um, how they, they debate definitions of terms, for starters. That's the first year of a 20-year program. Right? What do we mean by enlightenment? You know, what do we mean by liberation? What do we mean by consciousness? Mm -hmm. We have so many disputes among ourselves, we fallible human beings, because we are often talking about very different things, right? So they, they try to get the definitions clear from the beginning and then go on from there. So it's very fascinating. Uh, in the summertime, the weather is quite nice, actually, especially around central Tibet. But in the winter, they'll still keep debating in the snow. They'll dig out a sort of cave in the earth, and they'll sit down inside the hole and continue their debates. And I, <laughs> I studied this for six years in Dharamsala, and, I mean, the debates can go on all night. You just really get into it, right? So um, it's quite fascinating. And there are a number of books written about that, also now translated into English. So the uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition also continued the uh, custom of erecting stupas or reliquaries for great masters, um, usually when they pass away. And so these are examples of the Tibetan style of stupas. Well, they're found in all Buddhist countries, but um, in t the Tibetan tradition, well, there are many different forms. There are whole books written about how to build a stupa. Now we've got lots of stupas going up in, uh, in the United States. We've got three stupas on Maui alone. Yeah, I was lucky to be at the consecration of all three of them. So it's a kind of, um, you know, place where people can be in a good spiritual mood, do some meditation, 
um, usually the Tibetans will circumambulate them as a sacred place. Inside the stupa, there will often be relics of great masters. There may be sacred texts. There may be sacred images, images of the Buddha and the bodhisattvas and so forth. And so it's considered meritorious to circumambulate such a stupa or temple. Mm, here are the prayer flags that I mentioned before. They're simple pieces of cloth strung together and block printed with prayer. And then as the wind blows, they believe that the wind blows the prayers over the area for the peace and well-being of everyone who lives there, including the animals. Right? So now the story of the Dalai Lama goes back to the 15th century. And uh, the Dalai Lama that we're talking about primarily tonight is the 14th in a series of recognized reincarnate lamas. Now this presupposes the theory of rebirth, which the, the Tibetans inherited from Indian Buddhist tradition. Uh, according to the Tibetans, uh, the word Tibetan Buddhism is a misnomer. The, His Holiness says either it's Buddhism or it's not Buddhism. <laughs> you know? So they, they contest the idea that Tibetan Buddhism is something different, alien, and um, some of that is this perception of Tibetan Buddhism as alien um, has its root with the Christian missionaries who came to Tibet and did not recognize the tantric tradition as the uh, tradition that was popular in the mm, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries in India and, and even up to today. And so they thought it was devil worship. And so Tibetan Buddhism got um, categorized as something, something different, something sort of um, <laughs> scary and mysterious. They even called it Lamaism at one time. So I think um, that is part of the legacy of the 14th Dalai Lama, is that he's helped to clarify what Tibetan Buddhism is and what it is not. So mostly when he goes uh, to travel, he teaches peace and compassion beyond religions, as he says. He says, my religion is loving kindness. But he, when he speaks to Buddhist audiences, then he tries to, uh, he gives amazing teachings. And uh, his mind is just beyond. <laughs> so uh, he explains in detail, you know, all of the philosophical nuances of the tradition and explains that it all has its roots in India. So now, the figure that we're seeing here is the 13th Dalai Lama. The 13th Dalai Lama uh, lived until 1933, and he was a great teacher also, and a great statesperson. He was also quite radical in certain ways. Um, he had prophesied that Tibet would come under some threat, and he advised the Tibetans to be virtuous and to shore up their religious traditions and not to get involved in all of the, you know, delusions and um, sort of uh, conflicts and all of this sort of thing, to keep on the right path. He was radical in that he promoted Western education. Until that time, mostly education was conducted in the monasteries. And the monasteries were for men. So that left women out of the picture. Uh, as I'll show you later, we're making up for lost time now and trying to establish uh, philosophical studies for women, and it's going very well. But for hundreds of years in Tibet, the education was centralized in the monasteries. And they had uh, brilliant teachers, brilliant uh, textbooks, uh, and brilliant teaching method, where they actually debate all of these fine points of philosophy, and you challenge one another. So when I was studying in India, we had six hours a day of debate, right? And you had to study in, in advance. It's sort of like, what they got flipping the, flipping the classroom? Oh, yeah. Because if you didn't study, when you get on the debate court, it's embarrassing. So you have to do your homework in advance. And then when you get together, then you quiz each other in minute detail. And it, it's so interesting. 
So, so that was the system. And when the 13th Dalai Lama started to promote Western education, it was at first the, the great monasteries rejected it. They resisted it because they were afraid that if they opened up to Western education, they would lose their own traditions, that Buddhism would decline. Uh, nevertheless, the 13th Dalai Lama insisted on sending uh, six young men to England. They traveled on Tibetan passports, and they went to study uh, engineering and military science and subjects like this to try to help Tibet modernize and move into the modern world. Um, he also advocated for the establishment of a military. And this was also hotly rejected by the monastic um, institutions. They thought that this was completely against the Buddhist teachings. Uh, in retrospect, of course, he was right because, well, from a tradition, I mean, a contemporary sort of secular perspective, because when Tibet was invaded, they had no, I mean, they had about 6,000 muskets from, you know, the 19th century or something that weren't even working. So they didn't have much of a defense system at all. And so in any case, at one time, he was so adamant about these reforms that he fired all the abbots of the big monasteries, the three great monasteries in Tibet, Ganden, Drebung, and Sarah. Each one was like a city in itself with a, over 10,000 monks, a whole yeah, community there, self-sufficient community, basically, except they were dependent for food on the local community. Uh, but that was pretty simple because mostly the Tibetans ate samba. Samba is ground barley flour. It's a very convenient food because you can harvest it once a year, roast it, grind it, and then carry it in a little bag, and then all you need is your butter tea, and you mix it together, and then, you know, that's breakfast, that's lunch, that's dinner. It's, and then if you want to go into retreat, you just take a big bag of sampa, and, you know, a skin full of butter, and all you need is to collect some water from the stream and boil it up, and you're done, right? So, uh, in any case, in these big monasteries, then, uh, like any institution, sometimes they get fossilized. And for example, with so many monks living together, you have to have a system of distribution. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, the practice of generosity is highly recommended. So giving, they say giving. So to give food um, to the poor, especially to give food to the monastics and to the monasteries, is thought to be good karma and to have good consequences in the future. So Tibetans would off make offerings of sampa or barley flour to the monasteries, and then it was up to the officials or the workers in the monastery to distribute it. And the way they did it was that all the monks would gather for puja in the morning. Puja means a religious service. So they would get together and chant for a couple of hours, and during that chanting, they would come, the, the young monks would come running in with the tea, and they'd pour everybody a cup of tea, and then everybody would pull out their bag of sampa and make their breakfast or their lunch or their dinner. That's the way things worked, and it still works that way uh, to a great extent. I was just in India in January with the Kala Chakra celebration in uh, Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha got enlightened. And and the little monks would race in with the tea, and it was almost like being in Tibet. So in any case, he chucked a lot of them and tried to start all over again. But in the end, um, his intention of trying to, well, especially to implement land reform, because the monasteries themselves, because of this policy or this, this ideal of generosity, when people died, they would also give lands to the monasteries. So the monasteries did have large land holdings. And that was a point that later the communists criticized a great deal. So he wanted to do a land distribution. But again, he met a, lo a lot of fierce resistance from the monastic institutions. So he was a reformer but he was not completely successful in his reforms. If they had listened to him, history might have unfolded differently.
So here he is with the noble people. No, that was one other way to get an education, was to be in the service of His Holiness. They were t these uh, officials were trained in literature. Uh, their handwriting was impeccable. And uh, Tibetan is a very difficult language to spell. It's an, actually a nightmare to spell. <laughs> so these officials were the um, uh, experts in Tibetan grammar and handwriting and composition. So that was their job uh, in particular. Again, you'll, well, we can't help notice they're all men, right? With our modern sensibility, I just had to notice. So, so there he was, uh, the 13th Dalai Lama. And then he also made some predictions that there would be harsh times coming to Tibet. And you can read some of his works. They've been translated now into English. Um, the rebirth, his rebirth then, you see, he's the 13th in the lineage. And the 14th then, they set out to find. So how did they do it? Well, the uh, attendants and the, the great lamas around the previous Dalai Lama, the 13th, then set out on a search mission to find the 14th. And this is what you can see portrayed so brilliantly in the film Kundun. It's, it's the very first scene, is that the search party arrives. Now they sort of leave out the part about how the officials went to follow up on all of the tips, the clues that they saw. And many of them were sort of mystical. For example, they went out to a lake, and in the lake they saw certain letters that directed them to the northeast of the country. Many of them had dreams, right? Um, and visions, like visions of a monastery with a gold roof on a hill, and down below a farmhouse with a blue tiled roof and a dog with a spot on one eye. And then they also, where they, when they, uh, they didn't bury the 13th, they, they set him upright, uh, his body upright, and his body turned to the northeast direction. There were also many sightings of moss growing on trees in the northeast, which is very unusual, obviously. Normally it would be in the southern direction with the sun. So this all led to the idea that the 14th Dalai Lama would be born in the northeast. So they set out on a search party, and they arrived at this house um, with uh, a farmhouse, with a farming family, with uh, several children already, uh, two girls and uh, three boys already. And some of them had already been recognized as reincarnate lamas. So they sort of tested the young baby here, shown in his mother's arms, um, with uh, prayer beads. And this is also bril uh, you know, bril brilliantly portrayed in the film Kundu. And what they did was to reverse roles. The servants dressed up as lamas, and the lamas dressed as servants, just to sort of mix it up a bit, right? But when they came in, the boy was immediately attracted to the prayer beads of one of the so-called servants. And he reached out for it, and the lama said, I'll give it to you if you know who, if you say who, who I am. And he said, lama. So, oh, um, he, they were starting to believe that this might be the right child, the golden boy, right? Hedy Murphy did a really bad film on, on this. But <laughs> anyway, so... Then they came back the next year. They went back to Lhasa, which was about a six-month journey, and they reported what they had found. And they came back the following year and did a formal test. Um, it's, the way they do it is to lay out the possessions of the previous Dalai Lama, or previous Lama. He's not the only one. There are about 300 different lineages of these reincarnate Lamas. Uh, they, they lay out possessions of his next to a copy, a duplicate. Often a duplicate that's fancier, you know, shinier, 
uh, newer, prettier that a kid might like, right? And then they check to see whether the child selects the correct item that had belonged to him in the past. Now, most of these 300 lineages are male. There are few females who are recognized as reincarnate lamas, but very few. So most of them are male. So in this case, they had his teacup. It's indispensable for a Tibetan. Okay, Tibetans drink up to 60 cups of tea a day. Which reminds me. <laughs> yeah, so 30 to 60 cups of butter tea a day, imagine. It keeps them nice and warm. So, and they continue this tradition in India as well. I mean, at least, yeah, 30 cups a day, I would say is about right. So, and then they had the prayer beads. Well, he'd already selected the prayer beads. They had his glasses. Um, and they had his walking stick. Now, in the walking stick, as you see in the film, he, st he hesitated when they, uh, he couldn't quite decide which walking stick to choose. And you can see that they were really worried about that. But in the end, he selected the correct one. Later on, they found that actually the other walking stick had belonged to him at one time. So that was um, quite amazing. But he in invariably selected the correct item. Therefore, they knew that he was, in fact, or they decided that he was, in fact, the correct re um, rebirth of the previous Dalai Lama. And they arranged to take him to Lhasa. Um, at that time, this area of Tibet was already coming under the influence of these Chinese warlords. And they had to pay some kind of ransom to get him out. But they didn't say he was the Dalai Lama. They just said maybe some kind of Lama. And so, the, luckily, we do have some photos of him. This is my favorite. It's so adorable. <laughs> and you see the Tibetan clothes and the little um, pundit's hat. Actually, this is a pundit's hat from India, but it really caught on in Tibet, and they, they still wear them today. Um, so I, I just um, am so grateful that someone took these photos and managed to preserve them over, over the years. Um, he was a fairly naughty boy. Uh, <laughs> he was always, you know, having fights with his brother and so forth, but um, he was quite precocious, you could say. Um, his mother was extremely loving. He talked so affectionately of her, and her biography has just been published. So. Um, he was taken then to Lhasa for education and was eventually enthroned as the 14th Dalai Lama, just still a child. Yeah? Um, he wasn't completely lonely. Of course, he did have to separate from his uh, parents once he stayed in the Potala Palace, because no women were allowed to enter the Potala Palace. At least they could not stay there overnight. So, uh, but he did have a whole crew of loving caretakers, monks, and some of them were sort of like playmates for him. He talks about them sometimes and how he misses them. So his mother did come to visit sometimes. His father was um, quite a wild man, and. Um, so, but they moved to Lhasa, so he did get to see them sometimes. So you see the little Tibetan outfit. So cute. <laughs> and, yeah, so um, he had a very strict schedule of studies. Every day, all the monks are required to, and nuns actually, are required to memorize certain verses. And they are given the verses in the morning, and then they're tested on them at night. Now, today in our modern education systems, we don't do much memorization. But even when I was a child, we had to memorize a poem every week, right? And that, yeah, good. Some of you had that too. Uh, in Tibet, that's, that's the deal. You know, you memorize the book first, and then you learn what it means. And that continues until the present day. So... So he had a lot of work to do. And sometimes he was quite naughty and he got scolded. <laughs> so here's another picture of his family. Um, 
with his um, older sister, younger sister, and one brother. Okay, Galtendu. Yeah, so this is after they moved to Lhasa. Then they had a high status, so they were given a house and so forth. And he, staying in the Potala, then was expected to perform a lot of ritual activities, sort of formalities of the position, you might say. And he learned to do all of this. And there are some touching scenes of him sort of looking out the window at the kids ice skating and thinking, oh, I'd like to do that too, you know. But he, he had to fulfill his responsibilities as a recognized reincarnate lama. Um, so they pray for hours and hours a day. And then people will come for blessings, they'll come for advice and so forth. So it's quite a heavy responsibility for a young child. Now I went to school with a number of these tulkus, they're called tulkus, recognized reincarnate lamas, because many of them lost their monasteries in Tibet. And then when the um, attendants from their previous, the previous lama went to search for the child, they would uh, find them, but there was no monastery for him to go to. So they would bring the child to our school. So we had uh, probably about 10 or 12 of these reincarnate lamas. I was always a little bit jealous of them because they could memorize so quickly. It's al it was almost as if they were just remembering something they already knew. They just take the book and it, you know, amazing. And they were also quite naughty. Oh, <laughs> but they t all turned out well. It's quite remarkable. So, but of course, he is the h highest, uh, recognized as the highest of all the tukus. And uh, they had a sort of a schedule, you know, a ranking system in Tibet. Uh, this is another one of my fa favorite pictures. So obviously it was posed, um, but he looks so sweet. And... Yeah, this was his playmate, his, his um, favorite playmate, I think, attendant to Pala. And is mentioned, he mentions him in all of his books because he looked after him like a mother. Now, because of the changing circumstances in Tibet, he was required to take his exams for the Geshe degree when he was still very young. They wanted him to take over the government because the... The flaw in this system is that during the minority of the Dalai Lama, someone else is in charge. And we all know how that can go, right? The powers at court and so forth, competition and so forth. So they wanted him to take over the reign of s reins of government. And he really was reluctant to do that because he was just a kid. Um, but the first step was to take his Geshe exams. Now, the Geshe exams is sometimes they call it a doctorate in philosophy. Um, similar, but it doesn't have the liberal arts component. Basically, they study five sciences, medicine, the arts, and so forth. Uh, but mostly, it's about philosophy. Uh, you don't need to study other languages, even Sanskrit, although Sanskrit words are incorporated into Tibetan language, so they do know some. And so here he is shown taking his Geshe exams in front of thousands of monks, monk scholars, right? And he has to debate them and answer their questions. And it's really quite scary. <laughs> I mean, because it's not like, you know, our exams where we can uh, prepare in advance. I mean, any question can get thrown at you at any time. And you have to answer properly. And the way the logic system goes is that one question leads to another. And eventually, it sort of shows the limits of logic. You can take any position you want. You know, there is a God, there isn't a God. There, enlightenment happens, enlightenment doesn't happen. You can take any position, but you have to be able to defend it using logical reasoning. So anyway, he passed his exams with flying colors. And then he was asked to take over the reins of government. So in that position then, he was invited to Beijing in the 50s. And he went to Beijing to try to argue for the freedom of his country. 
So between 1950 and 1959, he really tried to work out some kind of resolution to this impasse. Now the tensions between China and Tibet had been uh, there, had been building for centuries. You can read the history. At one time, Tibet even conquered much of China in the seventh century. But they had what they called a Lama patron relationship. So Chugyal Pakpa, who was the great Sakya Lama, was, you know, a, a teacher of Qinlong Emperor, the Emperor Qinlong. And from their side, obviously, from the Tibetan perspective, the spiritual teacher is is the higher uh, ranking of the two. The patron is right, just the sponsor, right? But then the Chinese saw it in, uh, from their side in, in the inverted uh, fashion. So. So that sort of led to some misunderstandings. In any case, he went to try to work out some solution. He went with the Penchen Lama, who is the number second ranking Lama in Tibet. And they met with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai and so on. And they had a lot of good discussions. For the occasion, they dressed him up <laughs> in this, you know, sort of ancient style, which uh, is not typical for a monk. But because of his position, they ask him to wear this very, very traditional um, sort of fancy formal garb. And they had conversations for days. You see Joe and Lai on the left. And his mom was a Buddhist, yeah? That's how a lot of uh, temples and monasteries in China were saved, because Joe and Lai put the brakes on before they could demolish them. But at the end of their conversation, Mao Zedong said, ah, yes, but you know, religion is poison. The, the tradition, the archetypal Marxist adage. And then the Dalai Lama got really worried and he wasn't, he wasn't sure this was gonna work out. So when he got invited to India in 1956 for the Buddha Jayanti, Buddha Jayanti um, is the celebration, this was a celebration of 2,500 years after the Buddha. So when he got invited, he accepted the invitation, even though it's a really long trip from Tibet to India, because he also wanted to, to make allies. Uh, and in retrospect, that was a really, really good decision. So he met with Nehru, he met with many heads of state, many religious leaders, um, here he's shown, of course, all of this was new to him, you know, cars and, you know, India. India is always considered the holy land for the Tibetans because it's the heartland of Buddhism. It's the, um, uh, the Buddha was born just over the border in Nepal and got enlightened in, in India and taught in India for 45 years and died in India. So India is called the Pakpeyu, means the, uh, the noble land, yeah. So here he is again shown with the Penjin Lama, who was also young like he. Uh, and this is at the Theosophical Society in India. So he was definitely making alliances here and there. In the end, um, there came a time when the situation was untenable. They were getting reports of Lamas who had been kidnapped and uh, disappeared. And many had been killed and at first, in 1950, when the Chinese came in, they passed out silver dollars and were really friendly. But later, the, the situation changed. And because the Lamas were so highly respected, this really worried the Tibetans, that um, they weren't dealing with someone who respected religion. They were dealing with something that they hadn't encountered before. So one day in... 2000, um, sorry, in 1959, the uh, Chinese government invited His Holiness to a drama performance. But they insisted that he come without any uh, bodyguard, no security. And His Holiness said, oh, fine, no problem. But his, his people said, no way. <laughs> they wouldn't allow him to go. And Tibetans 20,000 strong surrounded the summer palace where he was staying and refused to allow him to leave. So then he consulted his um, counselor, you might say, which was a medium, the state oracle of Tibet. 
And they go into trance. It's all very dramatic. And he said, leave tonight. So the Dalai Lama dressed up in sort of um, security guard clothes and with his family then left for India. It wasn't the first time. He'd, he'd also left one time, but he didn't leave. He didn't arrive in India. He just left Lhasa. But this time, uh, they actually headed for the border because nine years later, things just weren't working out. So here he's shown riding a horse with the Kamba warriors. Kambas are fierce. <laughs> they're like really tall and big and strong, and they're, they're fighters. So they were his security detail. <laughs> And it took 17 days for them to get from Lhasa to the border. And he got very sick on the way because he wasn't used to the climate and all this. But these are the people who protected him and guarded him on the way. And they had several very close encounters. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's not an easy journey. But eventually, they made it. They arrived at the Indian border. And um, all along the way, actually, he was welcomed by the t local Tibetans. And many of them begged him not to leave Tibet. They were crying. And, and really, for them, it's symbolic of their country. Um, it's hard to explain how revered he is among Tibetans, but now, of course, around the world as well. Um, he finally made it to the border, and you probably saw in the news last week that he met with the guard who welcomed him. Yeah, he's 84 years old, so they had this beautiful meeting uh, just last week, and it's quite a touching moment. And uh, the guard in the film, he's shown asking, Sir, may I ask your name? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, so uh, this incident uh, was world headlines. Um, but unfortunately, no government really stuck up for the Tibetans. Uh, India offered asylum, which is quite amazing, considering that India is such a poor country relative to, especially at that time, relative to other countries, to admit 100,000 refugees was amazing. And they provided lands in South India where the Tibetans could create settlements. And they've been very successful in India uh, and Nepal. So once in India, he made good relationships with the Indian government. He was very close friends with Nehru. And it was Nehru's mistake, really, not to recognize Tibet as an independent nation. Um, now today, India spends a quarter of its uh, GDP, GDP, is that GNP, GDP? Yeah, on uh, military to protect that border. And the Chinese also, they've got, you know, a um, quarter of a million troops lined up on either side of the border, right? The Chinese have a quarter million there and the Indians have a quarter million here. And they could be using that money for other things, right? Roads, schools, right? But so that's history. Here he's shown with his mother. They've arrived in India now. She was really a remarkable woman. I never met her, um, but um, he speaks so highly of everyone speaks so highly of her. So I can't wait to read the book, her biography. Oh, that's repeat. Okay, so here's the whole happy family, and um, I don't know how I do this, but um, the one those it shows his four brothers, his mother on the left. The older sister next, who is the one who created the Tibetan children's village in Dharamsala, because a lot of children uh, lost their parents during the um, exile to, to, to from Tibet to India. And so she created this um, Tibetan children's village, and it, it's still continuing today. So they educated a whole ge several generations of young Tibetans. And then um, you have Gal the older brother. The all of them are quite brilliant. And they all worked for Tibet in their own ways. Uh, the older brother is like a diplomat. He's the one who's been going to Beijing and trying to work out some resolution. 
he speaks Chinese. And then um, one was um, a professor at Indiana University. The other was the um, first uh, maintenance worker in New Jersey, but then took uh, charge of the Tibetan Medical Center in, in Dharamsala. And then uh, to the right, you'll see Jessen Pema, who is his younger sister, who's now in charge of the Tibetan Children's Village. And then on the very right is Ngari Rinpoche, the youngest, who is um, really naughty, <laughs> very naughty. And, um, but he's, he actually became uh, head of the Tibetan Battalion of the Indian Army. Yeah. So now, one uh, thing that His Holiness did immediately was to bring together all the religious leaders who'd managed to escape. And so, contrary to you know some of the tensions that divide religious traditions, I mean the nearest nearest friends are often the most contentious, right? And we can get together for interreligious dialogue, but can we get together with the branches of our own tradition. That's this, the question. So he is, it completely um, transcends all of those kinds of barriers and tensions. And he brought together all these great masters and started to collect all of the books that they'd managed to escape with. Mostly, they weren't able to take very much. Uh, they'd often say, oh, I left Tibet without even my teacup. And that, for a Tibetan, is a disaster <laughs> because did I mention the tea, <laughs> right? So um, the, you'll see um, the Sakya Rinpoche, the Karmapa, Dujo Rinpoche to his left, to the right, Ling Rinpoche, Tijang Rinpoche, and Bakula Rinpoche. Bakula Rinpoche is actually an Indian citizen who managed to negotiate with the Indian government because he was a Ladakhi. And so he, they are like Tibetans, but they're Indian citizens. So. In 1904, when the British drew the McMahon line for British India, right, they drew it at the top of the Himalayas. So the people who fell on the Indian side of the border became Indian citizens. Well, that actually worked out pretty well for them because they were able to, um, to maintain their traditions. The, the downside was that they were cut off from their religious heartland, which was Lhasa and all of the sacred sites of Tibet. There are hundreds and thousands of sacred sites in Tibet because of all these. They, they were not so much concerned about material technology, they were concerned about spiritual technology. And they developed it to an extraordinary level. So um, the, the Ladakhis and all of these border people used to send their sons to, to Tibet to study, but now that was cut off. In fact, many of them were arrested and spent jail time, but the Indian government got them out because they were Indian citizens. I know some of them. Um, in any case, so that was an important thing. He immediately set out giving teachings because he wanted to preserve the culture of Tibet. And Buddhism is a large part of Tibetan culture. It's, yeah, it's a major part. And here you can see in very humble circumstances, he would just teach whoever came, and he still does that. Uh, I, mean, I mentioned that I just went to this huge gathering in Bulgaria, and people come from all around the world. There was translation into 60 languages. I mean, one of the biggest contingents was from Russia. Yeah. I mean, there's three Buddhist republics of Russia, right? Uh, including one that's in Europe. Did you know that? And they're all, they all follow the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And they, now they're, they have money, they can travel, so they come to India for teachings. And um, even there have been some tulkus now born in families, in Russian families. So primarily, um, His Holiness meditates about eight hours a day, somewhere between five and eight hours a day. Um, so he's a, a combination of someone who's very, very traditional, because that's his role, is to protect the tradition, and at the same time, he's very modern in outlook. He also reads 13 newspapers a day. So um, I've seen him uh, on occasion when they bring in, they used to bring in this jade cup for him to drink his tea out of, right? And they'll cover their mouth with a white cloth and they'll bring in the jade cups so that they don't contaminate it with their foul breath, right? But then His Holiness said, no, 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 no more jade cups. He wanted 
uh, an enamel mug with a yak on it. <laughs> so, so they said, yes, Your Holiness, yes, Your Holiness. So they went and found a, an enamel mug with a yak on it. And then from that time on, they come in with their mouths covered, holding the enamel mug <laughs> for him to drink his tea from. It's hilarious. Um, he, he meets with um, people from around the world because I was out in the courtyard debating for six hours a day. I saw the famous people that came to, to see him. I didn't always know who they were, but you know, if it's like the Prince of Denmark or something, then word would get around. <laughs> so, um, and he'd also meet some of these meditators that were invited to um, universities, uh, University of Virginia, Boston University, and so forth. Of to be tested for um, their meditation practice. They would hook them up to electrodes and try to uh, find out what the uh, physiological and psychological benefits of meditation were. And so the yogis would come down before they went off to Boston or Virginia. They'd come to get, uh, pay respect and get the blessings of his son. So we also saw all these great yogis coming down from the mountains. Um, in 1959, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, I remember very clearly in August, because I was in Tijuana in the hospital with snake bite, and it came on the TV. So that was very uplifting. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was also uh, awarded the uh, Congressional Gold Medal for his work for uh, humanity. He's been awarded any number of honorary degrees from many universities, and so people recognize him as an example of, a, of an ethical person, you might say. Yeah, which is, seems to be in short supply these days. So, um, he also met many of the most famous people of our day, like Thomas Merton would come to Dharamsala and they had wonderful discussions. He would meet with uh, groups of, of Christians and Jews and Muslims. He still does all the time. I remember there was a time when uh, some Christian brothers came to meet with him and they had two days of wonderful discussions and they agreed on so much and they were also very respectful of their differences. And then finally there discussions concluded on very happy note, lots of respect, both directions. And then he said, oh, I have one more question. How do you support your monastery? And said, oh, we make wine and sell it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So from a, a Buddhist perspective, I mean, you're not supposed to drink, right? And, um, and you're not supposed to make your living off of uh, that kind of thing. So it was really a sparkling moment of religious difference, actually. Um, he also met, of course, with Mother Teresa. And one of his best friends is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So they've just become the closest of pals. And a new book has come out. Um, a friend gave me the Book of Joy. So these two are like um, peas in a pod. <laughs> and they tease each other, and they have discussions, they have debates, and it's hilarious. And um, this one took to, oh, it's moving. Oh, I'm so glad. So you can see that he's, he knows how to boogie. And it's clear that the Dalai Lama doesn't know how to boogie. <laughs> so, so cute. <laughs> yeah. So His Holiness has visited Hawaii a number of times. Um, in 1994, I invited him to, to Honolulu, and he had made a four-day visit, both to Oahu and to uh, the Big Island. And he gave many events. One was um, a huge um, uh, gathering at the Waikiki Shell for uh, maybe 7,000 people. And then he gave a day-long academic event. He also met with Native Hawaiian leaders. And um, we also had an interfaith event, which was really lovely. So, and then we invited him for tea. <laughs> but he doesn't drink tea, he doesn't eat after 12. He keeps the monastic discipline very strictly. Uh, and so we served him hot water. <laughs> but, um, he's met with um, President Obama a number of times. 
um, sometimes through the back door, sometimes through the front door. But <laughs> and um, actually, Obama's sister is a Buddhist, but they didn't mention that during the campaign. <laughs> so uh, they had some really nice discussions too. He has met with Aung San Suu Kyi, who is now the de facto um, prime minister of Myanmar, and um, so he he's met with a lot of world leaders. Um, he's made a lot of changes in India. Uh, as I mentioned, in some ways he's very, very traditional. For example, he'll never, he'll never wear a sweater. Why? Because the Buddha didn't wear a sweater. <laughs> and because it's the tradition. You know, tradition, yeah. Tradition is very important in terms of maintaining one's culture. And when one's culture has almost been literally destroyed, people become really keen to preserve whatever they can, whatever is left of the tradition. So he considers wearing the robes and this particular style is very, very important. And it's uh, said to be there's a prophecy that the decline of the, of the Dharma, of the Buddhist teachings, will be when the monks just start wearing any old thing. So he, he tries to keep up um, a certain dress code. And... Um, at the same time, he's so open-minded, especially in encouraging women's education. So those schools that he started in the Tibetan Children's Village admitted girls as well as boys, and that's completely changed Tibetan society. So now we have um, young women going to law school, medical school, and so forth, and, and in, in pretty equal numbers. So, um, of course, it, it takes more than one generation to change attitudes towards women, but it's really remarkable how, how much progress has been made. In the nuns community, for example, before the nuns did not wear the yellow robe in Tibet. But when I asked him, why, why don't the nuns wear the yellow robe? And he said, oh, they don't? Oh. And that afternoon he announced that nuns henceforth should wear the yellow robe. It was as easy as that. Right? And then, um, one time I asked him, why aren't nuns allowed to attend the great prayer festival? In Tibet, it was only for monks, right? And he said, oh, they're not attending? Oh, they must attend. <laughs> and then he changed it. You know, he can change things just like that because he's the leader, right? <laughs> and they all respect him so highly. Now, he's been trying to retire. And now he has retired the last 10 years completely. But he was trying for many years to retire from his position and to establish a democratic form of government. So they established a democratic form of government in the Tibetan exile community, but they would always vote him as the president. <laughs> right? So, mm, so he said, mm, that's not what I mean. <laughs> it, it said, you have to elect your leaders. They said, yes, we want you. And he said, no, 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 you don't get it. <laughs> so it took some time, but finally he did uh, retire once and for all. And Lopsang Senge, who was uh, trained in the United States as a lawyer, is now the head of the Tibetan government. So um, he wants to try to institute systems that would work at, uh, when Tibet achieves its uh, independence. But he hasn't been talking independence. Now this is the interesting thing, is that he renounced any um, intention uh, to be for Tibet to become an independent state in 1986 at the Strasbourg Accords. He said he was quite, uh, he, he would be fine with Tibet being part of, of China um, uh, as long as Tibet could maintain its culture, its ident cultural identity and its religion. Um, so the claim that he is a separatist is kind of moot because he gave that up a long time, 20, more than 20 years ago, right? Hey, 30? 30, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, he's quite broad-minded in that way. We still have the question of full ordination for women, so we've been in dialogue with him about that for also about 30 years, and um, it's starting to move forward now. So we've done the research and we've tried to, um, you know, find all of the arguments against the full ordination of women. It's, it's not a matter simply of religious discrimination. It's a sort of a, a point of monastic law and the different procedures for ordination. 
And so well, we're working on that now, and it's, it looks like we're going to have a breakthrough soon. Because um, women in December, 20 nuns took the Geshe degree, the highest degree in philosophy, for the first time in a thousand years. So this was such a breakthrough for women. Uh, and I, I don't know if the world noticed, but it was a huge breakthrough. And they've worked very, very hard. And 20 of them were successful in passing these incredibly difficult exams, including six of my students. So I'm really pleased with them. Um, and, and it will not be the only time that women have the opportunity to take the exams. The system will continue. That's very important, too. It's, um, now, here's the uh, rebirth of the pension mama. Um, he was uh, recognized in Tibet, and they sent a, a message to His Holiness asking for confirmation. Uh, all the signs were there. The story of the previous pension mama was a rather sad one. He spent 17 years in jail um, and then died under mysterious circumstances. And his rebirth then has also disappeared along with his family. So he would be about 28 years old now, but nobody knows whether he's alive or, or dead or where he is. So that's quite sad. And they've installed an, another one in his place. Uh, but And the picture of the other one is in, they have to post it in the monasteries. They're obliged by the government, the Chinese government, to post that photo. But they, when I went to take a photo of it, they said, Oh, don't take that. That's a fake. <laughs> so nobody recognizes that. So this brings up the question of the rebirth of the Dalai Lama and how that will play out. So um, he's promised to live a very, very long life, no matter whatever it takes to, to see Tibet free again. And um, he said that he will make it very clear where he will be reborn. He won't leave it up to... Uh, any any government to decide. He'll make it. He'll make his wishes known. So, and people around the world have been saying that you know this is not just a question that concerns Tibetans. It's a question that concerns all uh, followers of His Holiness and the Tibetan um, tradition, because the Tibetan cultural sphere is very broad. You see, it's not just geographical Tibet. It reaches into the Himalayan areas of India, throughout Nepal, Bhutan, uh, eastern India, and then up to uh, over to Bhutan and up to Mongolia and into the Russian Republic. So it's um, and now, of course, all around the world with books like this. You know, people are sharing uh, Buddhist ideas, and he lectures here and there on on uh, Tibetan culture and on Buddhist ideas. So. Um, so uh, this is uh, just um, a painting of him. The young Tibetans love to paint Im his image and uh, here and there. It's quite a good one, I think. But um, So that's a sort of introduction to the life and legacy of the 14th Dalai Lama. Um, I have many stories I could tell. I mean, I remember the first time I had an interview with him, actually, was 1972, and at that time I was not yet a nun. I was a lay woman, and I was dressed in Tibetan clothes, which is con considered respectful for going to, to to meet him. And I had my hair in pigtails, you know, and coral and turquoise and all of that. And um, I had just completed a master's degree with a thesis on emptiness, the Buddhist, um, the Mahayana concept of the um, ultimately uh, empty nature of all phenomena. And so when I went to see him, I borrowed a tape recorder and some tapes and took it into the audience and I asked if I could tape the interview and he said, oh yes. And I had eight questions. The first question was, in some Western spiritualist traditions, they say that once you take a human rebirth, you do not devolve, you can only evolve. His answer was, you can be reborn as anything, anytime. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay, so next question. Um, the other seven questions, his answers were all about emptiness. It was remarkable. No matter what the question, he brought it back to the, the uh, philosophical concept 
of this lack of independent existence of phenomena. So uh, I was delighted. My friend and I were just delighted to meet him. And when I got home, I went, you know, with great glee to listen to the tape. And it was empty. <laughs> well, it sort of makes sense in a, a kind of sense, right? <laughs> so um, I remember one time my mother came to India to visit me, um, sort of suddenly. And um, it, His Holiness was always very kind to meet the parents of those of us who studied, because he said we had come from such a long distance, and he wanted to meet our parents. So uh, I applied for an um, audience with him uh, for my mother and myself, and she had flown in from Honolulu, and we were going up to the mountain, and then it started to rain. And, she's, and she sat, and she said she wasn't going. I said, Mom. <laughs> it, it, she said, no, it's raining. I said, but Mom, it's the Dalai Lama. And she said, I don't care. <laughs> so then, oh, what was I going to do? So I found someone with a car, and I just bl uh, brazenly asked if they would deliver us to the front door, and they did. And when we got there, you know, she was very sweet. She's a Christian fundamentalist, yeah? But the minute we walked in, she, she put her little paws together, and she was so sweet. And then um, he was very kind, and uh, she, she brought him a little alarm clock, and, you know. And then afterwards, she came out, and she said, oh, he's a very nice man. <laughs> so um, many, many stories. Um, we could say. Um, what I didn't add there was his relationship with certain Hollywood celebrities, especially Richard Gere. Uh, this has been a bit controversial. People think that it's just sort of a marketing technique, but in fact, Richard was coming to Dharamsala for teachings for years, and we didn't know who he was. And he'd studied philosophy at university, and he somehow he'd come to India, and he would just sit on the cement, you know, with the rest of us and take teachings, wearing jeans and everything. So we didn't know who he was. But eventually they found out that he was famous, and so they gave him a cushion. <laughs> yeah. So he's been very supportive of m many Tibetan enterprises. And um, one time I was sitting next to him at a conference in Delhi where he offered $10 million for health care for Tibetan lamas. Uh, so he does a lot of good work. It's not just a fad or a publicity stunt. Yeah. So um, what questions do you have? So we, are, we are open to questions. There are two microphones there. So in case you have any questions, please uh, we invite you to ask questions. Hi, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, regard Thank you. Regarding the Pension Lama, the one that Ch uh, China installed, I heard that he escaped the China control or whatever and is now and has met with the Dalai Lama and is now mm -hmm. free. Is that mm -hmm. true? Mm -hmm. That's um, the story of the Karmapa. The um, Gyalwa Karmapa, yeah, thanks for this question. Um, the Karmapa is a different Tulku lineage. In fact, it was the first Tulku lineage in Tibet. Um, and he, the Karmapa is ranked about 13th in this ranking system. And he was born in Tibet, uh, recognized that quite at an early age. Um, he had left a letter describing where he would be born. He'd escaped Tibet rather early, in 1956, he saw it coming, and he'd uh, settled in Sikkim, which was at that time, you know, well, let's see, it got taken over in 76 by India, but he came out in about, oh yeah, he came out in 56, so 20 years, so it was still an independent Buddhist kingdom at that time. And um, he um, taught in India, and he was a very famous lama, and then he passed away in 1982. And his rebirth was found in Tibet and recognized. And he was installed in Surpu Monastery, which is just 
well, if the roads were good, it would be just an hour outside of Lhasa, but it took us about three hours over bumpy roads. So uh, he was installed there and uh, started his education, and um, he escaped about 10 years ago to India. It's quite amazing. And he's fluent in Chinese, as well as Tibetan. He's quite brilliant. And he's been under the, under the supervision, the care of the Dalai Lama since he arrived in India. Um, and they found a, a monastery they, for him to stay in. Provi His Holiness provided everything for him, including tutors, so that he could become uh, the great teacher that he's developing into. Um, he's quite in an interesting figure uh, in that he's a feminist, and he's a vegetarian, and an animal rights activist. Uh, in, and um, environmentalist, so and fluent English, so um, his, and he's also begun uh, a process of ordaining women. So it may be that, whereas the Dalai Lama himself is constrained by certain formalities and certain very conservative senior monks, the young Karmapa may be able to get it done. So and he wouldn't be doing it without his holiness's tacit approval, I'm quite sure. So this is the one um, that has a duplicate in India. And uh, someone had promoted a different Lama as the Karmapa. So both the Pension Lama and the Karmapa, they have these disputed claims. But I think in the case of the Karmapa, very f almost everyone accepts the one that was recognized by His um, Holiness Dalai Lama. And uh, well, check it out for yourself. You know, the Buddhist uh, thing is that uh, we don't have to believe in anything. Yeah, we just, um, you know, check it out. If it works, you know, then if it accords with one's own experience, then we accept it. So that's what His Holiness teaches in terms of universal responsibility, universal compassion, is that if we practice compassion in everyday life, then we're happy campers, right? Our, our lives become easier, and our relationships become better, and our, even our health improves. So it's um, just a matter of checking it out for ourselves, testing the teachings, and seeing whether or not they work. If so, if you know, people want to, do, uh, wa want to practice um, you know, loving kindness, that's a good thing, right? We need more loving kindness in the world, don't we? and compassion. But he's really not into um, making people Buddhist. Quite the contrary. He keeps saying, uh, you know, don't become Buddhist. <laughs> if you're a Christian, be a good Christian. If you're J Jewish, be a good Jew. If you're Muslim, be a good Muslim. Uh, don't, no need to become a Buddhist, right? Just practice your own tradition, but do it well. So uh, that's quite extraordinary. Is that clear, the, the history there of these two disputed lineages? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Oh, uh, this is a little bit of a personal question, but I just was asking, what's one thing that you believe can lead to a life full of happiness? Oh. I, I know it's a little bit away from the Dalai Lama, but you know. <laughs> Well, it's actually quite appropriate because that's the kind of thing that he talks about all the time. <coughs> it's really very simple. All we have to do is get over our self-cherishing, right? It's our attachment to self that makes us so unhappy. So by grasping at our own benefit, we're never satisfied. But when we work for the happiness of others, we naturally become happy. Right, so it's all a factor of compassion and loving kindness for others. And if we could just s gradually let go of our self-concern, our self-interest, our selfishness, basically, then it frees up so much energy, right? And that spacious quality of, of mind is what's so, so pleasant, what we call happiness, right? That was very poetic, thank you. Um, 
So could you explain emptiness to a 10-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the most... <laughs> emptiness is the most profound concept. But I think that if we were going to explain it to a 10-year-old, we'd explain it in terms of dependent arising, that all things are interrelated. So because things are interrelated uh, and changing all the time, there's no fixed identity to things. And then we can check it out, that a person is not the same at 10 years old as they were when they were a baby. Right? We call them by the same name, but they're changing all the time. Because things are not fixed, things are interrelated and impermanent. So that's the main idea. Hi. Is there a copy of your thesis available to be read? Oh, actually, you know, I'm so sorry, but I burned it. Okay. <laughs> Yes, um, I found it rather embarrassing. When I went to India and studied about emptiness, I saw that my master's thesis was complete rubbish. And so I um, lit a fire in Manoa Valley, and with the resident lama together, I threw it into the flames, and we got busted by the Honolulu Police Department, <laughs> who came up and said, Oh, no open burning. And I said, yes, officer, I, I totally understand, and put in the last pages. So <laughs> fortunately, there is n no embarrassing remains. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. But y I do have uh, some explanation in a book called Into the Jaws of Yama, Buddhism, Bioethics, and Death. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, you might um, be interested in that book. Uh, so uh, I don't quite understand about this emptiness just based on, you know, very, very simple uh, understanding. So if there is this emptiness, if there's no independent sense of things, why do you insist on preserving the culture and the tradition? Oh, good question. Okay. Um, well, um, everything is impermanent. We know that. Things are changing all the time. But there's some very beneficial aspects of culture that can be helpful for all of us, like questions about ethics, questions about compassion, uh, wisdom. The wisdom traditions all have something to say, right? So uh, emptiness does not mean that things don't exist. It just means that all we have to do is put a match to this and it's, it's up in flames, right? Everything is impermanent, changing all the time. Uh, so that that's the it doesn't mean that cult I mean of course cultures change also cultures change all the time but once a culture is destroyed it's impossible to reconstruct it so when we see the cultures of the world today uh, being destroyed left right and center it's quite tragic because many of them have something to teach us um, we see now all the Native American traditions have preserved this amazing lore about respect for the earth that we need so badly. Uh, fortunately, there's still remnants th and, and that can be revived. Uh, Hawaiian culture is the same. Now it's being revived, and, and we have much to learn from it. So there is beauty in preserving tradition, but we don't have to preserve all aspects of, of the culture. Um, I always say, you know, take the best and leave the rest. <laughs> so, um, sorry. Even, even, so all the good things you talk about are also impermanent. Why ah. do you want to preserve that? Well, oh, that's true. That's true. Um, also, also, the good things are impermanent. Also, we are impermanent. So we have to recognize that. And that's, that's what brings the Buddhist back to the present moment. You see, if we recognize that things are impermanent and lacking in any kind of fixed eternal existence, then we appreciate the beauty of this very moment, which will never come again. 
usually we're so spaced out. We're thinking about what we did in the past, what we're going to do in the future, you know, worrying about this and that, regretting what we're, this and that. And so we miss the present moment. So that's why the Vietnamese monk ha- talks about present moment, wonderful moment. He said, this is, the, this is the time, right here, right now. This moment is absolutely precious, and we, if we live completely in the moment, then we can let go of our attachments to past and future, all of our fantasies and this and that, and be perfectly content and happy right now. So it's a win-win. things. One was almost um, a fluffy question, which was about the photographs that you showed initially, because they were so beautiful, and I was just wondering what the background was in terms of not even the Dalai Lama, the obviously the older pictures, but just the more recent ones, if those were your photographs, or... Yes, um, some of them are, but most of the old ones I cribbed off the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then the other one, um, I came here somewhat of a, with a heavy heart. I'm a middle school teacher. Tomorrow is our last day of school. You'd think I'd be elated. And I am because um, that, uh, that's just the nature of ending of school year. You need to end in order to begin again, I think, with that energy that, that it takes. Um, and I work with, uh, as an English language development teacher. And I just had a student who all of a sudden was gone um, as of last week. And I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, Most of them are either recent immigrants. Some of them were born here in the US. And I just was, my heart just broke when I got an email back because two of my students, uh, seventh graders said, we think that immigration was involved. And so tomorrow is our last day of school. The eighth graders are promoting going on to high school. And I almost didn't come tonight because I just wanted to kind of sit and think, what am I going to say to these kids? Um, and I, I just had a connection when you were talking about His Holiness and you know, obviously needing to escape. Um, I, when I do go home, I'll reflect on some of the things that you said. We've talked, I think you know a little bit about my practice. Um, so I'll keep all those things in mind. But I'm also curious, what do you have to say? This was the email that I got from the person that works with the migrant workers, which is his family. She said, I just talked to one of the family friends. And yes, sadly, last week they had their court date and their request for asylum was declined, and they were deported last Thursday. And I have his little things there that I was waiting to give back to him. He just got an award for seventh grade, cause, and he literally, like what you just said, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much. Um, he, would, he would literally, I would say, okay, we're gonna focus on a science article. He would like clap his hands with glee, you know? So I'm just sad for him and his family. I hope certainly the best for them, but also for myself as a teacher, the heaviness of that and how I have that compassion for these kids that I do have and just in general. So I'm sorry to be so long-winded. Thank you for sharing your experience because it is really tragic. And it's mm, one of many tragedies especially refugee uh, tragedies that we read about and hear about and see. Um, And so many other problems, too, that humanity is facing, especially right now, I believe. So I think that um, I I don't get any royalties or anything (laughs) from this book, but um, actually it was the eBay people who, who produced this book of joy. But there are a lot of tips in here that you might find interesting. I bet it's going to show up in the public libraries because it really helps um, understand how to overcome sadness and how to 
recover a sense of joy um, in uh, the, the every moment of daily life. Um, it's uh, not a matter of forgetting, but there is, by this method of generating compassion for living beings, uh, the possibility to maintain a joyful state of mind. And we, we're going to need that. We're going to need a joyful state of mind because if we're sunk uh, in sadness, we cannot be very effective in the world. And I, I was part of the movement in the s Berkeley in the 60s, you know, and we, I, I witnessed how easy it is to fall into despair and anger. And then from there, it's just a small step to violence. So um, and in the end, it, it, it doesn't work well. So the idea of keeping a happy heart so that we can be more effective in reaching out to our students. I mean, bad things are going to happen. And p children get sick. Um, some of my students have even committed suicide. I mean, how do you, f how do you cope with that? And so we ha I think that this method of learning to um, keep uh, a joyful spirit a, a compassionate heart that remembers the sufferings of living beings and generates consciously generates loving kindness toward them. And it has the effect of uh, healing our hearts. So it's very practical and it it's can be practiced by everyone. So going into the classroom uh, tomorrow uh, and you have many other students too who need you. They need your your joy, they need your positive outlook and your loving kindness. So uh, I think that it's a challenge, but I think it's one that you, you can learn to handle. We, we all can learn to handle, right? Because hardships are going to arise. That's the Buddha's first, first teaching. You know, problems are going to arise. That's inevitable within the human condition. But how do we handle them? Right, that's the main thing. How can we change our perspective on the issue? Um, remembering that this one child is, is just one. There are also millions of others who are displaced now. And then also, I'm, I'm an activist. I think that we can sign those petitions and we can work um, to change the laws and we can make our voices heard in terms of immigration and so many other um, political uh, problems too, yeah. So, carry on. One more, one more question. Okay, I have um, a question. It's my understanding that the Dalai Lama has all have always been male, and I was wondering what Buddhism kind of says about that, if anything, mm -hmm. and kind of relatedly, um, if the current Dalai Lama has discussed maybe coming back as a woman or something. <laughs> well, in fact, he has. You know, people have asked him this question, would you consider taking a female rebirth? And he said, well, yes, if that would be most beneficial to sentient beings, then I would be happy, to, uh, it would be a good thing to take a female body. He said, but if people in society don't listen to women, then it wouldn't be very effective. So, um, it's possible. It's possible if, uh, the, I mean, society is changing. At least certain segments of society is changing. So it's, it's possible. Um, that depends on transforming society, and we've still got a way to go in terms of transforming society to a, a really egalitarian model. We're not there yet. Um, but he's, he's been made many positive statements about women. For example, he said that Buddhism in the Himalayas is in the hands of women, uh, in the hands of the nuns. And his, uh, he said it about 10 years ago, and people were wondering, but now when we look at it, very few young men are becoming monks. But many young women are still becoming nuns. And they're s studying very well and practicing very well, so it could... It could very well happen. And then with this latest breakthrough, I think that uh, with the nuns taking this highest degree of philosophy, it's going to encourage many other women. Not that everyone's going to become a nun, not at all, but to see women successful in any field is encouraging to all of us, isn't it? So 
I think it'd be great if he came back as a woman. <laughs> uh, but it depends. He, his, the vow of the Bodhisattva is to benefit beings um, as much as we can. And not just human beings, but also other animals and beings of all different forms, which could include invisible forms. And so they call it skillful means to find the method that is most skillful for benefiting sentient <coughs> beings. So we could, uh, I, I remember, you know, in Tibetan culture, they have this prayer, may I be, be, be reborn as a man in my next rebirth. <laughs> and some of us uh, Western women are looking at each other no, 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 <laughs> right? We, we just couldn't say it, right? And even some of my Tibetan friends, they said, oh, yeah, I used to say that when I was young, but I don't say it anymore. <laughs> so things are changing. In so far as the Dalai Lama and many of the higher spiritual people who have been exiled has been good in some sense to the world, but the Chinese are not going to give up Tibet. And they're building a railroad and they're populating t Tibet with a lot of Han. So how does the Dalai Lama and the exile community seek to reconcile this gap between the spiritual culture and the incoming influx of Han people that's going to transform, if not decimate, the original culture. I mean, he seemed to have recognized, as you say, in 1986, that it's not going to be a separate, but it's going to, he's okay with being part of China, but as long as it remains in independence in terms of culture. so. I'm sort of wondering how does that jive in terms of the political situation and the spiritual situation? Yes, well, um, the situation in Tibet is really, really terrible, and it's getting worse. And the Tibetans are very, living in Tibet, are very dispirited. They say it's like living in prison. And they're rewarded for becoming like Han, you know, the better you speak Chinese, the faster you're promoted and so forth. Um, they're um, making it very difficult for the children to learn Tibetan and to maintain their culture. They've s torn down uh, many historical buildings, in including some monasteries. And um, there are some monasteries that are functioning, but very quietly. And um, as long as they don't voice any political sentiments, um, they're often allowed to exist uh, up to a point. But if they get too big, then the government will come in and just raise the place. So you might have seen in the paper the last few, few months they've been talking about the camp at Ladungar. It's a huge monastic settlement of meditators. And the one who began it, um, well, they, he, he died under, he was poisoned, actually. And they came in one time when there were 10,000 people living there. They came down and just leveled the place. Now, 10 years later, it's just built up because it's a sacred site. And mm, hundreds and thousands more people have come in to meditate there and study there. And now, in the last month, the government has come in to start destroying. And they said... Um, they plan to destroy 90%, no, 40,000 people living there. And if they and they plan to destroy 90% of it. So these are constant challenges for the Tibetans, and it's very, very difficult. Their, their sole hope, really, is their faith in um, His Holiness and the Dharma, the Buddhist teachings. So all of these teachings on how to keep a happy heart now are very real for them, because if they get depressed, I mean, some of the young men have become, you know, alcoholic and so forth because they feel so um, depressed at the situation. But, of course, that doesn't help anything. 
And on the other hand, I think that the spirit of the Tibetan people is quite remarkable because, you know, privately they keep pictures of their mamas, including the Dalai Lama, and it's a source of inspiration for them. So we all find our inspiration in different places. For the Tibetans, it's all in uh, the Buddha and the, the, the Dharma and the Sangha, including their teachers, right? So they always keep this in their heart. And so then, I mean, hopefully they never give up hope that Tibet will someday regain its freedom. Not necessarily political independence, but the freedom to, to be Tibetan, to speak one's own language, to practice one's own religion. You know, that's, that's what they're hoping for. So I think it's a day-to-day -day challenge. And so we can, by educating ourselves, we can also help to educate others and, um, you know, try to prevent totalitarianism wherever it may arise. It's, um, it's the same question, actually, uh, wherever we find it. So, yeah. Mm. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you for your good questions. Thank you.